Hi, it's Vince Hall. I'm here with Peter Morgan. So today I want to talk about how Peter became the CEO of a deep learning company, consulting company. But um, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. How about you, Peter? How, you know, uh, how would you say in your words, how did you get to where you are today? Oh yeah, so that's a good question, Vincent. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I did a um, PhD in physics, particle physics, a long time ago, 20 years or more. And um, I worked in IT uh, for the last 20 years in, you know, broadly, IT broadly, right, information technology. So that, that, you can, that, that could mean anything. So I was sort of a um, networking engineer, uh, solutions architect for companies like Cisco, systems and IBM um, and then I went and I did an MBA to learn more about the business side of things uh, after that um, I actually looked uh, that kind of piqued my interest in finance so I thought I'd use my physics physical um, sort of reasoning science background to become a quant basically in the city right that's a common sort of journey for for a physicist who who leaves physics <laughs> and becomes you know goes into business um so i did that for a few years um but then the market crash happened right and pretty much everything and they were very very established you know there wasn't much going on actually in the cities they changed all the regulations so i had to actually think quite hard about what i was going to do right because i you know i didn't really want to go back to being being a solutions architect uh in networking again um but I, I knew i wanted to do something quantitative to use my skills right so i actually went back to academia for three years uh which is quite a long time yeah so i was basically a research assistant on a physics experiment measuring the mass of a neutrino okay so back to physics um using you know all this open source software Py a lot of python um you know uh database sql that kind of stuff um version control platforms git you know all the stuff that is in demand in, in the workplace right so so after that i honed all those skills so i came back um to london actually and i thought okay um you know how am i going to use all these skills put everything together and you know and, and make and get a job basically Luckily at that time, this is 2012, right? Beginning of 2013, sort of big data was just becoming a thing, Vincent. And uh, that, that, that's the, so, you know, from there it's been a pretty straight line, right? Big data, data science, you know, there's this thing called a data scientist, right? And so I never looked back. So the, the last seven years, eight years have been just all data science using the new tools, deep learning, TensorFlow, you know all the, all the python libraries that kind of thing Excellent. yeah all right so well so so you're um you founded a new ceo of deep learning partnership that's right. i founded my company yes because i wanted to work for myself that's the other thing yeah. Nice, yeah so how does deep learning partnership work yeah how it works is that uh, initially it was just me uh and then you know learning to trade hadoop you know back in the day it was all hadoop spark deep learning wasn't really a thing in 2012 really uh so i did all the big data stuff um you know data science was a bunch of python libraries like um numpy scipy pandas all that good stuff um so it was just me for two or three years um you know i teamed up with a few other people entrepreneurial type of people and we kind of did a few projects together and uh, in the end, I just decided to really have my own company, Deep Learning Partnership, registered at Company House. And um, since then, I've either done it on my own, and done, done consulting gigs, or, or you know, employed a few people with me if the if the projects were big enough. So it's just been you know working for clients in London, mostly in London, Some, sometimes overseas, but yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, so how how have you found that? What, how was it? How easy was it to uh, start all that up? Yeah, well, it is quite tricky. It was hard, especially back in 2012, 13. I mean, it was very early day. I mean, there was a lot of great meetups and good meetups in London, right? Um, and so, you know, going to two or three of them every week, deep learning, data science, Spark, you know, Hadoop meetups. And so you met a lot of people. We were all going through the same things. You met potential clients, but a lot of, you know, engineers like myself, 
who were just getting this whole thing off the ground, really. And it was quite fun and exciting because it was most of it was open source. You know, Spark was open source, as you remember. You know, there's Cloudera, Hortonworks, um, and uh, Mapar. You know, so um, two of those don't exist now. Yeah, certainly Cloudera left. So you know, the 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 field has changed. You know, watched it grow and change and develop. Um, the one thing that's probably happened is that, you know, basically um, the big cloud providers have, have, have won. Okay, AWS, Google, and Microsoft. Um, you know, you can, and obviously, obvious why, if you want to use a TensorFlow to scale, you just, you know, run up a cloud instance, okay? Yeah. You know, so, so really everything's gone onto the cloud more and more shifting onto the cloud. It's either, you know, on-prem or cloud, probably about 50-50 these days. So the big guys really won in the end. The big guys won, it's just fine. But it's still all open source. It's just, um, yeah, it's, you, you probably end up using Google, Amazon, or, or Azure, yeah, sure. as, you, as you probably know, right? That's, that, that's the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be running TensorFlow or PyTorch on that. Or, you know, some kind of machine learning framework. So, you know, I'm specifically, when I say data science, I've I'm, I'm been doing machine learning, you know, for the last four or five years. So I don't really use anything else. I'm pretty much, well, 90% deep learning. Yeah. Okay. Cool, yeah. So what sort of clients do you have? I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a good question, actually. So any vertical, healthcare, automotive, self-driving cars, uh, drug discovery, uh, genome sequencing, financial companies in the city, insurance, uh, you know, tra high frequency trading. Uh, so very, very right, you know, right across the spectrum. So anybody who, who wants to use deep learning, yeah, I can help them out. I've been helping them out basically. Yeah. Nice, yeah. yeah, so I guess with deep learning, you have, have to have a certain amount of data to train it all on. Like, yeah. um, so are they normally quite large organizations or? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, initially it was all startups, uh, Vincent. Uh, it was just more of a match when I'm on my own and sort of, you know, who's gonna trust, you know, a guy who just rocks up, you know, is HSBC gonna hire me or are they gonna sort of use IBM and their team of consultants or Accenture? So at the beginning it was all startups, which was great. I had a lot of fun. I worked in a lot of startups, yeah. And I love startups, I am a startup. Um, so yeah, it's kind of more of a natural match, right? Um, to do that, startups work with startups, and big guys work with big guys. And but I've had since in the last two or three years um, more work with uh, the larger corporations. Actually, I, I won't really name any names, but yeah, it's, no, no, no. It's, it's tended towards that as well. Yeah. Okay. So it's both. Yeah. Okay. So um, so a little bit before this, you were in academia, you say for for a few years. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, back. yeah, what, what made you uh, go into academia? And then, yeah, that's a good question, right? So, yeah. it was a bit of a big step to to go back. You know, it's almost going back. It's a step back, but I saw it as a step forward because I wanted to learn all these new skills. Yeah, I wanted to hone up everything, and you know, so and I did that really. You know, I, I was a systems engineer before for ten years working at Google. I mean, sorry, Cisco and IBM BT Labs. Um, systems engineer. So that's not much programming. It's more command line. It's more, you know, you do everything at the command line. You log in to the switches, the routers, things like that. It's not really a program. You're not working at an IDE at all. You're just working at the terminal. So, so I really wanted, you know, to, to get that programming experience. So that's, I saw going back to academia is a good way to do that. I would get paid. I would be in an environment, you know, I love and quite familiar with. And, uh, you know, I could just train, use that to train. I, the other way was just to sit at home for a little while and just learn everything by C++, yeah. But I, I, I couldn't really imagine, I couldn't see that. So, yeah, you know, I'd rather be around in an environment, picking my skills up, getting paid, and, you know, having a little bit of fun doing it. Uh, and it turns out, you know, this experiment led by Stanford to measure the mass neutrino was fun. I mean, very smart people. We learned a lot. I, it was fun for me to get go back to physics and sit, you know, catch up on what was happening in the field. That was a little side of bonus, yeah, and pick up the skills I needed. Yeah. So, so was that more of a that was more of a physics, yeah, back to uh, what you were doing before. I mean, 
Was that's my training, right? right? Yeah, it's that's right cool. at the age of 27, I think, you know, I did nothing but physics. Yeah. Right, yeah, nice. Okay. And then, uh, and then you say you wanted to work for yourself, so you founded yeah. uh, a company. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the other thing, you know, do I try and work for a company or do I try to work for myself? And obviously it's far more risky to work for yourself, right? There's no security blanket, there's no comfort blanket. So, I, but I, I like that. I like to take risks. I'm risk reward trade off, you know, and also I had a company in the past, my own company, after I left university actually for a few years. And, you know, I, I knew I enjoyed that. You know, I like working for the big guy, like IBM and stuff like that as well. Cisco, a great company to work for, great engineers and everything. But at that time in my life, I, I decided I wanted to work for myself. Yeah, sure. Okay. So how was, like, how high did you get before you went back to academia? How senior did well, you get? Well, yeah, I would say, you know, technical design authority, lead architect on, on, you know, global projects for these companies. Yeah, working at consultancies or, or directly into the company. Yeah, so BT, I think, was the last company I worked for. So, yeah, it was pretty good. You know, the, you had to take a pay cut, put it that way. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, it's all about work life, you know. All good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so... Um... How is your work-life balance now? Like, it's good. I do nothing but work. Yeah, but if you enjoy work, it's not work, right? <laughs> oh yeah, if you're doing what you love, sure. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, doing what I love. Yeah. So I, I, f I feel I'm lucky in that respect. And also, it's a long-term uh, play, right? Working for yourself, building your own company, you're building something for the future. Yeah. Working for a, another company, you know, it's almost week to week. You get paid it the end of every month right with, with uh, starting a startup it's like oh i might get paid in three years and then you know a bit more in five and a bit more in seven and a bit more in ten so you know to watch something grow like that is also part of the fun yeah. right so so how did you work with the payments was it like uh, on a project basis yeah it is it's yeah. always project basis um yeah sometimes i'm embedded in the company uh, i'm not really it's different from being an employee employee uh, uh, but it's not like being a contractor either it's a consultant so you know but it's a consultant for my company so it's not like being a consultant for McKinsey or Accenture where they put you in and embed you it is like that except it's my company doing it so you know all the profits mine I don't have to give 60% or 80% to McKinsey I get to keep the whole thing and I get the satisfaction of getting the deal, closing the deal, doing the work and, and coming away. So for me, that's more satisfying, yeah. Excellent. So do you do, do you do remote work as well? I mean, yeah. or COVID-19? I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing remote work now, actually. So I'm very lucky in that respect, yeah. So a lot of what this work can be done remotely, right? Uh, programming, software engineering, systems engineering, yeah. So, so we're kind of the lucky ones, right? <laughs> Yeah. in that if there's any upside to this whole thing right it's it's the fact that we're in a good position but you know you got to think about what everyone else is going through as well though you know yeah, yeah. but as a software developer um it's you know fine to, you know it doesn't really affect us that much yeah sure especially if everything's on the cloud i guess yeah so exactly yeah no it's fine. yeah yeah everything can be done remote yeah Okay. And so you said most of your clients were in London, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. they are now. Yeah, I went over to New York for a little while. Um, I've been to Europe a couple of times, but yeah, 90, 95% London based, which is fine. Yeah, there's a lot of good industry in London, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Did, have you ever worked like cross borders? Like, have you ever worked remotely across borders? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, some of my projects, well, one in particular was, yeah, based overseas. Yeah. In Europe. Yeah. From, from London. Yeah. It doesn't make that much difference, really. But yeah. 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 I mean, they're over there and I'm here logged in on my laptop. But apart yeah. from that. Yeah. But most, mostly it's London based. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we're, we should probably all be used to um, that sort of thing, uh, you know, meeting online now. Yeah. 
True, right? And Zoom and Skype and everything. Yeah, Google Meet. Yeah, I've used them all. We use them all. Yeah, it's all good. Uh, Microsoft Teams, they're, they're all good. Excellent. Yeah, that's a good time to be, to have some of that technology, like if you are Zoom or Skype or. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. And you notice the share price of the uh, big tech company, Amazon, Zoom, uh, you know, they just doubled over during the course of this thing. It's, it's a sort of bittersweet thing, but uh, techs, techs, it's, you know, tech is, it's been very, very good to tech. Just put it that way. Wonderful, yeah. yeah it's been good to some. Good for some, I know. So. Yeah. It's a new world. <laughs> yeah. It's just a new world, yeah. Yeah. I think sort of sped up some things and kind of going, going in that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it might might have taken three years for us to get there, but instead it's taken three months, and uh, we'll probably never reverse it either. Now people see how cost effective it is and efficient, and how much they enjoy it working from home. Right? It's okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we just get used to habits, right? We're creatures of habits, human beings, and uh, we needed something to just say, okay, we can just switch everything over, you know, really quickly, and then because you have to. <laughs> You can't go into work, right? So, and then yeah. people have found they've adapted and found it's it's great. Yeah, yeah. up to a point. Right? So, like, so do you? Uh, so, you say is it not just you at the moment in your company? Uh, how big is your company now? Right now, we have four of us, but it's been up to ten. But at the moment, it's four. So we're flexible. Like I say, if I got a huge project tomorrow that required 12 engineers, I would probably reach out into the market and try to get them. But for now, yeah, it's four. Yeah, we're doing two projects. Yeah. yeah. So what sort of people are they? Um, machine learning, deep learning sort of people? Yeah, they're all technical, deeply technical. Yeah, so I do all the business development stuff. And the technical hands-on when I have to, especially if it's just me. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, deep tech, yeah, purely hands-on, yeah. So they're very experienced. Um, most of them have to, at least master's degrees in uh, computer science for sure, and possibly PhDs, <laughs> plus five to ten years, you know, work experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I differentiate myself as a as a boutique with highly skilled engineers. Right. That's one of the ways I differentiate myself yeah yeah so about that like how many how much do you think we're uh it's okay for data scientists to have just a master's degree or even just a yeah. bachelor's no that's a great question because you've got to start somewhere right and okay. yeah i have worked with uh people who are on the route on the journey right they're just finishing a bachelor's degree or, or doing a master's degree part-time um, and they're great. I mean, they're very good. They're young. They're very enthusiastic, and they're picking stuff up really quickly. So you know, that's the way to do it. To start there, uh, to cross train as well. You know, you don't have to have a degree in computer science. I didn't, right? I have a degree in physics, but I learned what I had to learn on the job, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So I guess, like you, I started with a physics degree. Um, yeah. But then I went into so I did a PhD in machine learning and chemistry. And then right, they decided right. to job right out of, after that. So, Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nice combination. Yeah. Oh yeah, because it's the physics and the science degree that kind of helps the thinking, right? The data and, yeah. and analysis part. Yeah, that's yeah. pure science. Really. To uh, questioning and uh, making sure you have proof of things, right? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's a whole philosophy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. the scientific method yeah. underpins everything. Yeah. So. So do you think that there's a move for companies to worry less about academic uh, education or will you, do you think that it's steady, that um, for a long time you will need data scientists to have uh, lots of qualifications? No, I don't think a degree is completely necessary. No, it comes down to the raw skill and the person and the drive and the ambition of the person. Uh, you know, I'm not a snobby elitist. You know, you have to go to university to become a data scientist. If you haven't, I'm not going to recognize you. I think that's BS. No, it just comes down to the person. Really, There's a lot of hackers, right, who, 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 who teach themselves at a very young age. And 
they're probably the best of all. <laughs> they're very entrepreneur, they're, bus they're very business-like thinking, plus they've they got the technical skills. So, um, But academia, it does give you a certain uh, depth and, and breadth as well. So you definitely get to exposed to a lot of different technologies in a more formal structure. So there's not one or the other, they, they can complement each other. Nowadays with things like Coursera and edX, a lot of this great training is online, right? From MIT, Princeton, Oxford, right? You can get the best training almost for free online. So universities are kind of, it's a bit of a gray area now, right? Um, again, with tech, because of tech, we can get a university education if we're diligent and uh, very disciplined, that's the only thing. How many people start these great courses but don't finish them? So if you're at university, that will, you know, almost, you know, forces you to completion, right? It's not many people, some drop out, but not 90% probably finish a university course, whereas those Coursera courses, maybe 10%. Um, so the content's probably the same, but you have to be super disciplined and, you know, have a very clear vision about where you want to go and what you want to do but it is a changing world and I think online education uh, I mean I don't really see a future in universities you know I'll make that bold statement yeah everything's online uh, why and it co they cost so much money yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean with the COVID-19 sorry Vincent last thing um, you know in America they were gonna say you know uh, we'll, we'll cut your funding if, if you don't have online classes and they, they said, no, you know, we're going to have online classes and the government backed away. I mean, most universities are doing online courses right now, uh, almost 100% online, right? So, again, this has accelerated that process, right? It totally has. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my partner's a university lecturer at the moment and okay. she just she had meetings with students, uh, either one-on-one -on -one or lots of them yeah. online just like yeah. everyone else and uh then she's doing lectures yeah online yeah exactly exactly uh, it's okay yeah i mean humans need that human interaction and you know we're social animals but a lot can be done online for sure yeah sure. Yeah. yeah but universities have served their purpose for a thousand years right but i think things might change now yeah yeah, yeah i actually uh have very similar feelings to you like okay there's a lot of good that can come from universities, um, but you can also get a lot available online. For and, everything, uh, yeah, if you want it. Oh, and, and it's flexible, so do it yeah. from or when, yeah. you, when you need to pick up yeah. Practice. Yeah, again, I think it's habit, right? We've had them for a thousand years, like I say, and uh, it's just a habit, and now we've been forced to break that. Everyone's doing it online. Uh, they're offered by university, but it's online, so. I think after this, people will realize we'll just leave everything online, maybe. I mean, these are all predictions of the future. I could be dead wrong, right? But this is where I see it going. Yeah. So, so what if you have two candidates uh, and on paper, they kind of look the same. One of them studied online and one of them studied in a bricks and mortar yeah. university. Cool. Yeah. Does it come down to the, uh, the interview? How do you tell? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You come down to the interview, the coding test. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the only thing universities have is brand, right? If somebody has a, you know, computer science degree from Princeton or Oxford or MIT, Caltech or Imperial College, you know, um, it says something, right? It says you got into Caltech or you got into, you know, you, you, you're there. As opposed to rocks up with a Coursera, like 10 Coursera courses, you know, okay. You know, but yeah, so it's, it, it comes, so that's the first thing. After that, it's the interview, how good they are at actually as a software engineer doing, you know, real uh, quantitative testing and then the qualitative testing as well. So you do the interview process, I think, tells it all, it, it all paints a picture, right? Mm -hmm. But just having a degree from Imperial or Caltech, it, you know, that's part of it, maybe 10%. And then there's, you know, 10 different things that you would add, add up in the end. Yeah, give you the complete picture and the complete decision at the end, yeah. I know it's a bit sad really, right? It is different to think, you know, that, you know, your degree from Caltech or Oxford might not, you know, be worth what you just put into it in terms of time and money. It is a bit strange to think about it, yeah. Yeah, it's a huge investment in both time and money, as you say, yeah. It is, of course, so, three, four years, yeah. yeah. So, as I understand it, it seems 
similar to what you're saying, um, like especially with companies, you've got to prove yourself. You've got to prove that you can do the uh, the work. That that is that. Yeah, yeah. That is say, like you say, you know, testing rounds. And... Yeah, you might be a very good academic, but not really fit for work. The other thing is, um, at, at the bachelor's level, I think there's no real no different no real difference from someone for, with a bachelor's degree from Caltech, MIT, Oxford. And, and somebody who's done a lot of training by themselves. When you get to the PhD level, there might, there might. If you have a PhD from MIT or a bunch of Coursera's, you know, because there's a lot more research involved. So you want someone who's actually done research. That, that might be a, where universities have the edge. If you're a research scientist, right? Yeah. Or a research engineer. Yeah. So you've got to really know how to think like a scientist at that point. Yeah, definitely. So, so how often do you think, um, like, if somebody they look they look good on their CV, their resume, yeah. they seem good in the interview, they seem good in the tests, and then do you give them like a trial period to work with you? How how often do you? Yeah, uh, because of my work is sort of consultancy. It, it, uh, you know, that's more for a full time employee. Have a three month. See, I don't take people on full time. That's the thing that we we I take people up. On, on a project-based approach. So yeah, I pretty much test them out in the interviews. Yeah, and the other engineers as well, we test them out. And if they're good, we put them straight on the project. Yeah, there's no real upskilling or training or anything. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, I guess that's a good point. Uh, so I suppose data scientists have to spend a lot of time making sure they're keeping up to date with the technology. Would yes. be fine. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. It's constant. I find myself constantly every day, two or three hours learning something new, which is the fun part, right? That's, that's, we're lucky in our jobs. Yeah. We get to learn new things every day. Yeah. Which is good. There's always a new library, a new package, a new paper, a new result, a new benchmark being passed and to a lot of conferences, you know, Neurips, ICML, deep learning conferences. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to keep up with, right? Yeah. Like, and that gives you an edge too. If you go into a company and you can actually deploy, um, you know, uh, a very new result and, and get, you know, a, a quantitative advantage, that's a good thing. Yeah, that's a differentiator actually. Yeah. Yeah. Results. Yeah. Okay. So, like, uh, further to that, what sort of advice would you give to some more junior data scientists? Mm -hmm. looking to climb up the ladder yeah okay so yeah just keep going right just keep doing it it can be a bit of a slog sometimes you can feel like you know you've made no progress but you're actually every day you are making progress if you're, you're studying or working you know you are um, if you're not then you're not making progress but if you are it can feel like you're not even today I can feel that way sometimes it's like oh my god you know I know nothing about this field <laughs> you know but then you get a good night's sleep and you go you know what yeah I know quite a bit so just keep going that's the main thing yeah and um, so how can people find out about about you and uh, your company well I'm on the web deep learning uh, partnership is deeplp.com so I uh, have a website, yeah, you can contact, there's a contact form there. And uh, I'm on LinkedIn, personally, my company, Twitter, and uh, Facebook page. But yeah, just the website is probably the first place to go. Everything's listed there. Excellent. Well, thanks. Yeah. And, um... So yeah, if you need any deep learning expertise, just reach out. Yeah, we have a good consulting team and we, we can get more people as we need them, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, well, thanks very much, Peter. That's been that's been great. Yeah. We have learned a lot. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Vincent. Nice talking to you. Good luck. Excellent. Cheers. Okay. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll stop it there. Bye. Cheers. Bye.